preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Robert Gilson. I direct the School of the Arts here at the 92nd Street Y. Um, as always, I try to do a little pitch here, and our summer classes begin uh, the week of May 24th, and we hope that uh, some of you will join us for a great summer of art here at the 92nd Street Y. Um, this evening's lecture with Lorna Simpson marks the last event in this year's Artist Vision series. Uh, we hope you'll join us again next year for another uh, great, event, great series of events with uh, Rob Storr. Um, we're looking forward to interesting evenings with uh, Carol Dunham, uh, Bryce Marden, Andy Goldsworthy, and hopefully Rachel Whiteread. The moderator for Artist Visions is, as always, Robert Storr. Mr. Storr is a curator in the Department of Painting and Sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, exhibitions he has curated include Willem de Kooning, The Late Paintings, um, Deformations, Aspects of the Modern Grotesque, um, and uh, from the collection Abstract Pure and Impure, um, as well as last year's Chuck Close and Tony Smith retrospectives. Uh, Mr. Storr is the author of monographs on Philip Guston, um, Chuck Close, and Louise Bourgeois, um, and he's currently working on um, a um, on an exhibition, three-part exhibition, um, of the uh, museum's collection called MoMA 2000, uh, which sounds like it's really going to be just extraordinary, um, and a re retrospective on uh, Gerhard Richter. The format for this evening. Uh, is as follows. Mr. Storr will introduce Ms. Simpson, um, and then Ms. Simpson will give a slide and video pr presentation of her work. Um, after the slide and video presentation, um, Mr. Storr and Ms. Simpson will have an informal discussion about her work and ideas, um, and that will be followed by questions from the audience. Um, please help me to welcome Robert Storr. Um, good evening. Um, just not as a correction, but amplification of uh, what Bob said about the Moment 2000 shows. Um, I am working on this exhibition along with about 50 other people. Um, the entire curatorial staff of MoMA is uh, dedicating itself to looking at its own collections and rethinking the ways in which uh, they have exhibited them, thought about them, the ways in which modernism in general uh, has been regarded through this century in advance of moving in not only to the next century, but uh, beginning to try and reconfigure uh, the collections and the way uh, that they are presented in light of uh, very recent events. And in a sense, that's exactly what this evening's uh, situation is about. Uh, it happens that my colleague in working on these exhibitions, uh, the one I work with most immediately, is Peter Glossy, who's the chief curator of the photography department at MoMA. Um, and it is in many ways over the past 10, 15 years at least, in fact longer, but certainly the 10, 15 years, uh, in the area of photography that some of the most uh, dramatic changes in attitude and working approach have occurred. Um, the notion of the self-contained image has now been uh, not challenged so much as uh, matched or uh, complemented by a large body of work where the photograph is a part of a series of statements, and language can play a part in making those statements as well, and where those statements are by design incomplete, and the viewer must put them together and reconfigure word and image in uh, many possible combinations of meaning. Um, this is what many people talk of as being postmodern photography. The other monikers that go with it are deconstruction and so on and so forth. But really, it's an approach to the image as something where the artist brings into play possible meanings, but in fact leaves the viewer to contemplate how the language of images itself operates. And Lorna Simpson, beginning in the middle 1980s, and carrying on into the present day, is one of the people who has done that uh, in a most thoroughgoing way. Um, I would like to add also that uh, there are many people who engaged in this in the 1980s who, in a sense, got locked into a very finite version of what could happen under those circumstances. And that Lorna has shown by work done in the 90s that it's not 
a, a closed stylistic set of possibilities, but an open-ended research into the language of, of, of images and words and text in all kinds of permutations, which have resulted in her having made prints or used in any way print media to make images, and indeed in making uh, videos and films. Um, so what she will bring this evening, I think, as uh, our speakers generally do, uh, is a view of the work that she's done. But this work represents uh, a major contribution to one of the things that makes, uh, to sort of close out this uh, parentheses, that makes the task of coming to terms with the relations of different media and different ideas about art at the end of this century so very, very interesting because it's, in fact, still up for grabs. So uh, I'd like to introduce Lorna as somebody who keeps it up for grabs and let her speak for herself uh, for a while. Thank you for coming. Um, what I thought I'd do is kind of discuss work that I've done over, I guess, since between the 90s, um, early 90s and now. Um, and that work has gone from uh, doing photographic works on felt um, to working in film and also doing a kind of a return to a more traditional form of photography that I actually never quite um, explored except for maybe when I was uh, in college. So the work that I will begin with um, is a work that I did called Wigs, if you would start the projector or if I start the projector. And actually, the light off of me <laughs> would be great, because it's right in my eyes. Um, this is a piece uh, that I did, which is called Wigs. And it, I think it was like maybe 1993 or 1992. And it consists of uh, lithographic imagery printed onto felt. And the idea of working with felt kind of came to me at a point with my work um, that the work that up to this point that I had been um, within the art world uh, known for was work that had uh, a figure, and uh, what accompanied that figure was a series of, of texts, and it would be either a man or a woman, but predominantly women, whose faces are obscured or kind of by their pose or the way that they are presented uh, to the audience. It is not known who they are exactly. So they would stand in the kind of his surrogates with texts that would talk about issues in terms of race and gender um, and sexuality. But it got a point, I came to a point in my career um, having, um, experienced a kind of success quite as a very young person that I wanted to shift and change. When I kind of realized that an audience had a certain expectation about the sort of work that I should be doing, that was the moment that I said I definitely should be doing something else. Um, so kind of uh, very strictly, since a lot of the work that I do and continue to do is very formulaic, I decided to um, eliminate the figure from the work at this particular point. And in doing so, decided to use surrogates surrogates, meaning that um, having hair stand in for the individual or in terms of talking about um, an individual or their persona as opposed to having a person try to represent that. So wigs turned into the series of things of working with felt, which actually came out of working with the fabric workshop. And it, it's a piece that kind of talks about the distinctions of, um, that we make in terms of distinctions that are made societally um, in terms of gender. So that while one can use a wig to uh, ch shift one's appearance, so that um, in terms of shifting one's appearance to be more masculine or quote unquote more feminine, I kind of detail throughout this piece, which you can kind of see through these, I don't know, these little squares or text panels. And the texts within this work talk about different moments, either historically or in terms of uh, specific people's uh, particular experiences, where they changed their appearance in order to accommodate um, or to be considered from the outside another gender. So there's one story of um, a man named Kraft and his wife who were both slaves who decided to escape to the north. Uh, his wife was very light skinned and he was very dark skinned. So the way that they escaped was that she posed as a man, uh, an elderly white man, and that he was to be her slave and that is the way that they made their way north. And they came, by the time they got to New York, because they're actual, I mean, they were kind of on their way to Nova Scotia, but by the time they got um, up to New York, the, problem, the problems that they faced were more the thing of uh, trying to hide the fact that they could not read. And that was the thing that almost gave them away. But the wife decided to act completely arrogant of how dare you uh, try to uh, interrogate me um, as to my, 
as to my identity or who I am or why should I have to, if I'm on my deathbed traveling, have to read to you, and they kind of made their escape. So th that's kind of one of the examples and stories that appears in this piece. Another one is about Gal Gladys Bentley, who is an entertainer in Los Angeles, and kind of all the, in LA in the 50s, there were these laws against, um, or trying to curtail the way performers dressed in terms of cross-dressing on stage. Um, so it kind of goes back and forth with a more societal ob obsession with trying to identify one's sexuality or identify it um, vis-a-vis post-mortem examinations of one's body or a person whose uh, sexuality was kind of a contention or, or was not um, pinned down that at the time of their death, everyone is very eager to find out what the true identity of their gender is. So Wigs for me is a kind of, um, it's a map of kind of the way uh, that there are obsessions about um, pinning down one's uh, gender or pinning down one's sexuality by these quote unquote norms. And these are details um, from the piece. It was kind of made out of, um, I live in Brooklyn um, near Fulton Mall, which is a, a kind of outdoor mall that has 90 million hair shops on one side of the street. So I would go, I kind of spent one afternoon and went like to each one and purchased about 60 different wigs. And actually, the more elaborate the wigs are, meaning um, either they're braided or they're curled, the cheaper they are. The more they, of course, the more they look like human hair. Like I got a little afro that cost, you know, three times <laughs> the amount of money as opposed to, you know, um, other things that are presented. But it was an interesting project, and it was kind of a step for me to kind of uh, work outside the formulas that I had worked maybe probably 10 years prior, or eight years prior. It's another one as a mustache, as another device. And the other one, I mean like the text with these two little wigs, which are really wigs for dolls for female dolls. This is, um, some t uh, sometimes she dressed them female and sometimes she dressed them male, kind of as um, there are pieces in the work that um, focus on kind of parental obsessions with um, children and how the child is actually maybe having, like a male child that has an obsession with mannequins or dressing up in the mother's stockings and the mother's concern vis-a-vis -a, -vis a conversation through a sociologist um, about her son's sexuality. And kind of it reveals more about the, the parents' um, obsession with this any, than anything about the child. So then kind of a play on that of um, desiring to control that by the, uh, having the child maintain some kind of conformity by either the way, how they play or how they dress. Um, and this is a photograph by, which now goes to another piece that I did called Nine Props. This is a photograph by James Van Der Zee. And I was invited um, kind of during this period to Pilchuck, which is a glass school in Seattle, Washington. And in my private life, I have an obsession with vases. I have so many vases, it's kind of ridiculous. I can't help but go to flea markets and get one more McCoy or one more, um, you know, whatever kind of vase from the 30s until the 60s. So I'm sitting in Pilchuck, which is a um, glass school, and they invite artists to come down. You don't have to have any knowledge of how to blow glass. And they have really amazing people who will act as gaffers for you, meaning they will blow or, or create anything out of glass that you want. My first intentions were to go there with the idea of, oh, you know, I'm gonna do tumblers with text, and then I'll sandblast the text, and then I'll build this armature. And I had a kind of idea in my head when I got there what I would do. But arriving there, you kind of realize that it's um, this very, I must say very 60s, but because um, it's out in the middle of the woods and you know, it's a lot of young people in camp, but it's also kind of pyromaniacs that have found their joy. <laughs> because there are people like pouring, um, you know, they would cut down a stump of a tree and then make a mold out of it and then pour, you know, I don't know, 25 pounds of molten glass into the smoldering piece of wood. Or another person is like, you know, this kind of acrobatics with hot glass. So for me, it was really like, you know, do I concentrate on the work or do I fast, am I fascinated by these very toned bodies who are dancing with this very, um, dangerous material. And you know, and it's the old fashioned thing of, you know, humans sitting in front of a fire. You can't take your eyes off of it. 
so that was my dilemma. I got there and said, I don't know what I'm going to do. Because <laughs> they weren't interested in real, like, you know, they said, we'll teach you how to sandblast, but, you know, that's not very, you're not using uh, the abilities of the people that have been chosen to work with you. So I got in a car, drove for two and a half hours down to Seattle and found a book that I actually had at home by Deborah Willis, um, which she did a compilation of, uh, of the works of James Vanderzee, who was a photographer who photographed actually not too far from here in Harlem um, from kind of the turn of the century till uh, the, I think 1987 was the time of his death. And he would photograph uh, celebrities, the average person. I mean, you could go to his studio and have your portrait taken of your child or yourself um, for a nominal fee. But as he became um, more well known, and certainly towards the end of his life, um, it became more uh, photography of celebrity. But they're very posed images, and they're quite, quite lovely because they're um, painstakingly um, arranged. And there was a um, particular interest of his to reveal something or to try to have a representation of the person's class, their aspirations and um, a certain amount of pride. So these photographs are very staged and very posed, but in a very meticulous sense. So what I decided to do sitting out in Seattle was to have these glass blowers, which was the best thing I could do, make vases. I said, since a lot of his images have these vases in them, which I quite love, um, for them to duplicate them in glass, which is what they did. So for instance, this is called Bow of the, uh, the Ball, and to I guess to her left is a vase containing flowers. So that got reproduced. Um, this is the reclining nude, which there is a painting, a painted area here of a um, vase that has been turned upside down. And there are flowers. I guess it's a little out of focus, which isn't too bad. Um, but there are flowers strewn on the floor. So I had them recreate that one. And this is a portrait of Benny Andrews, who is a painter um, who lives here and in North Carolina. And the vase to his left with the chrysanthemums um, is what I chose to have them duplicate in black glass. So what came out of this was this, which is um, a kind of series of, which actually, let me see if I can get it better in focus. Um, actually, if you would manually focus that for me, I would appreciate it. Um, what turned out what is this piece, which has all these different shapes, which, of course, for my own personal obsession, I love it. But, you know, as a piece, it doesn't really quite work. Uh, what goes above, what uh, kind of occurs above it is text of me re-describing the photograph. So I kind of, in my own way, in a kind of history of photography sort of mode, but with my own kind of uh, curiosity and obsessions, describe the photograph and kind of, not so much a critique of it, but um, the details to me that culminate in a description of the person in those three areas that I spoke of before in terms of what their aspirations are, their, um, their wealth, um, and kind of how they, how they wanted to present themselves to the world. So what I ended up doing and this is another photograph it's, um, of the boxers and all these uh, women, predominantly women at the table, are uh, about to toast him with champagne glasses, which I, um, or mart excuse me, martini glasses. I decided to use it as a still life and thought that was a far more better, uh, appropriate tribute to uh, Van Der Zee to kind of take it one more step further and get beyond my obsession with the actual object. Um, and it becomes the still life of the objects in his uh, thing, in his, of his photographs. And below, it's the name of the photograph, the year that it was taken, his name, and again, um, my description and kind of that it's predominantly a room full of women who are toasting uh, this boxer with the way are either, I guess it's a champagne glass, with champagne glasses um, and the way that the table is laid. So the piece is called um, Nine Props as of nine props out of his photographs. And it became an edition set printed on felt. I also then started doing these pieces um, and kind of leaving the figure completely out as a kind of another examination of photography in kind of arenas that I had not entered before in terms of the work. I mean, I'm quite familiar with them in a kind of historical way, but not in terms of um, involving any of that in my own particular work. 
So I started to do these um, landscapes and uh, architectural details. Um, and what kind of got me to this place was that I was in um, New Mexico traveling and I stopped in a bookstore and picked up a book by Pat Col Calafia, which I always mispronounce her name. I can't remember the correct pronunciation. But she has this book called Public Sex. And it was kind of this very entertaining anecdotal um, text, kind of historical and anecdotal, about the activities of um, individuals either underground or kind of um, meaning, uh, like, uh, how can I put it? Um, what is considered kind of taboo sex that's uh, act, enacted in public. But kind of the history of that and how, uh, in terms of parks or public spaces, how groups or individuals kind of choose those spaces and what the social dynamic is um, just behind these acts in terms of how people congregate or how they act out these acts individually. So I decided, I thought that was a very interesting thing, also in terms of photography, because a lot of my work up until now, um, the relationship of the text to the image is always a little bit of slippage. There's always, um, the text mentions something that is absent in the image, and the image kind of reveals something that is absent in the text. And I thought, well, this would be an interesting um, combination of the two to kind of talk about these sites, which look very plain, very... Um, kind of mundane photographs of different landscapes or rooms or of architectural um, sites. But to infuse um, those images with um, thoughts about public sex in the sense that, for instance, this one reads, it's a hotel room. And from once, uh, the bottom image is of a kind of regular suite and the top image is of their penthouse suite. And the text that reads uh, to the left is kind of about the dynamic that I see uh, the hotel as a public space, the level of privacy or uh, that one is afforded given what kind of suite you're in and what sort of activity you're involved in. That if you're in the penthouse suite, basically anything can take place <laughs> without hotel security um, demanding entry or having questions about noise or anything. But if you're in a different sort of suite, you don't have that same sort of guarded. Uh, protections. So there are different works kind of that go through landscape and architecture. This one is called The Park and has two dialogues um, going. One is um, a, a kind of monologue in one's head that if you have ever uh, been to a place before but you want to take someone else but you don't want them to know that is, uh, you've been there before with someone else but to make it seem all fresh and new. So this kind of monologue um, in one's head but at the same time trying to make the experience seem new and interesting to someone um, that is unfamiliar with that. And on the left is a um, description of a scene from a John, um, John Waters film of actress Desa uh, Divine, who which is in female trouble, which um, Divine plays a 16-year-old girl who is quite upset because she didn't get what she wanted for Christmas. So she um, gets very angry, uh, starts leaves the house and hits the road and starts hitchhiking. She then picks up a auto mechanic who is also played by Divine. They talk for a little while and they end up having sex on, in a kind of wooded area, some, very similar to this, um, by the side of the road. So for me, it's a very funny scene within that film because um, Divine is having sex with himself in the way that it is edited. So this kind of, again, kind of this uh, park, but kind of what is a reminder to me in terms of this sort of landscape and also just in terms of the way that it's used in film and also the way that one may access the space um, in terms of having sex. So it's not so much about the acts themselves, it's more about a kind of psychological um, state of mind and how one approaches those spaces. This is called the park. So on one side um, is, and also about, as in this one is gonna be, a, is about it being a voyeur. So on one side is a text about having a shiny telescope and the person in, their, you know, in a voice is talking about having a new shiny telescope and being able to peer into the park or across the park into the other apartment buildings. And on the right is a um, description of the work of a man named Lord Humphreys who was a, a sociologist who decided in the 
early 60s to study the activities of men in public bathrooms, which was very taboo because homosexuality was seen not as worthy a subject at all to be studied in terms of um, any kind of uh, sociological study. Um, and he's an interesting character for two reasons. A, because he took that uh, sort of uh, material on, but he also ethically had, there was a lot of problems with the way that he worked because he would follow the men home, or, or he would write down everyone's license plates and then a couple of years later interview them at their homes with their families and kind of for him it was kind of this interesting uh, double life that people were leading, but kind of ethically as a sociologist it's a little problematic. <laughs> <laughs> And he also, I mean, and he takes great and um, care to define his presence, which is, oh, I am acting solely as a voyeur or a lookout. I don't engage. I do this. So the, the, it's a very funny, um, th the way that he constructs his presence and his observations and what position he is. Uh, what position he is watching these activities is very constructed and very interesting. I mean, to kind of look at now. Um, this is called Hayes, which um, has a running text of two people who are sitting on the roof watching other people have sex, and one person does not see it, so it's kind of mapping through a landscape of rooftops to help the other person see where these people are located, and kind of by the time they uh, kind of map through different uh, locations or kind of landmarks of water towers or air conditioning units um, to map the way to where these people are, they have already kind of gotten up and left. So the text kind of reflects um, a different sort of map from rooftops. And um, this is called Parts, which um, is about having sex in a museum which one of my girlfriends, because um, I had done, a, this work actually started in maybe 1993 or 94, um, and I did a show at Sean Kelly, and it was about five or seven pieces, and a friend of mine who's a very close friend said to me, what about the museum? I used to do that when I was college, why'd you put the museum in there? So for that reason, I felt I had to do a museum piece. Um, but it kind of really reflects the architecture of the Guggenheim in terms of the way um, the back staircases are used for public or um, staff, et cetera. Um, this is another uh, kind of multiple piece that I did, um, which is called Circa 1940s, um, which are of two found photographs. One on the left, I kind of found on a flea market of a woman. Um, and then kind of by her dress and um, the props and stuff, you can tell it's in the 40s, um, with a kind of on a tattered, you know, man in the moon set. And on the right um, is a segment of a f uh, film still, Hollywood film still, I think from um, Stormy Weather. So for me, it's kind of the pairing of these two images were very interesting to me because of the, you know, given that time frame and given that one is tattered and one is kind of seamlessly um, soft, um, lights kind of at that particular time for the purposes of entertainment or for the purposes of presenting oneself of having a photograph of oneself taken at that time kind of the illusion um, at that time in the 40s that American of Americana and kind of either given in film or kind of the way that it's um, tatterly um, displayed within the still photograph of this woman um, anonymous woman because I don't know who that is it's a very interesting thing in kind of the entertainment um, industry and the construction of imageries of imagery during wartime, which is kind of I guess we're at the same place um, now, having Star Wars come out at the moment that we are at war. And this is called uh, still, which brings me kind of to these uh, monitors that are kind of glowing blue in your face. Um, I started doing film projects and had an invitation to do an artist in res residency at the Wexner Center in Columbus, Ohio. And this is a quote unquote still image from one of the film projects called Interior Exterior Full Empty. <clears throat> and what I did from the film and kind of how this is a reflection of the film, this is one projection of a seven um, room projection piece, or seven projection in seven projections in one room, and one of the projections is of this landscape, and you kind of are watching as you can see, like there's a river and then there's um, a culvert there. You watch these actors as I had directed them that come in and out of the frame, 
or kind of in different parts of the landscape. And they're either kissing or talking or arguing um, or making out. But it's kind of, and it's all silent. So you're kind of watching from across the water their activities and trying to s decipher what their relationships are to one another, again, as, as a kind of voyeur. What accompanies that, that, so that would be the exterior. And this is kind of um, a slide of the way the projection looks in the room. On the right side are interior scenes. So there's a bathroom, a bedroom, a dining room, um, and a couple of living room shots in a bedroom. And there are, in, in that way, there are conversations that go on between individuals or over the phone that you are, again, the voyeur, but this time it's about the text. It's about um, the stories that these people are telling, either about other people or kind of intimate conversations. So for me, it was this room to kind of pull the audience in different directions, either um, as a voyeur to try to figure out the relationships vis-a-vis um, -vis kind of just visually or having these very st static shots within a room with actors um, telling these stories that were, that to entice the audience, it was completely about the story that they were telling and not really much else um, that was going on in the scene. Visually, I should say. Um, the other film project, or the next one that I did was called Called Waiting. <clears throat> Uh, which I have, which I'll show uh, this evening. And it was done with Insight, which is a show that comes every two years in uh, Southern California and San Diego. And I, at that point, having, um, and they were kind of done back to back, I wanted to do something that was just a single projection that was a linear narrative, meaning that um, the scenes kind of follow one another and there's some kind of thought process that um, there's a connection between each character as they come up, as opposed to the last one that I sh showed, um, which it seems, it isn't, but it seems arbitrary in the way that the narrative flows. Um, this particular one, it's about, it's called waiting and there's interruptions of these telephone, converse, uh, of these conversations that are clipped and interrupted by another call. So you kind of get these uh, very short narratives and trying to get connections between people and trying to figure out well, who is connected to who or what the narrative, um, narratives that are um, interrupted, actually. And the last one, which I have done, did, which was uh, this past summer, um, which is called Recollection. Um, and Recollection is, again, is a little bit more a little less uh, linear, but it's a single projection and is about the nature of memory and how uh, one chooses to remember or chooses to forget uh, certain things and kind of having uh, the title and I would, my desire was to have it start out to seem more nostalgic than it actually is. It's more having an ambivalent feeling about forgetting and lack of memory is kind of what the piece is about. So in doing these, which I um, realize I mean, I studied film in undergraduate and graduate school, um, but didn't want to quite get involved with the fundraising and kind of pulling that kind of, those kind of resources together to do something for like 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so I always put it on the back burner, something that I might get to at some point, but didn't really have a strong desire to fight that hard financially for it. Um, so it was a really nice opportunity to, to be able to work at the uh, Wexner Center because it, they introduced me to a great crew of people who I've worked with, like Tom Hayes, and there's um, many like, independent <coughs> filmmakers who live in Columbus, Ohio, because uh, a lot of uh, commercials get shot there. Um, and it also revealed to me the kind of um, maniacal side of my personality that I just love telling about 10 people what to do, like just throw more questions at me. And I just love the kind of energy of making a lot of decisions in a short period of time um, in order to get something made. And the collaborative aspect of it, because I, up until that point, a lot of the work that I've done was very just me um, working things out or maybe collaborating and having somebody with another artist to fabricate something. But this was a kind of true collaboration with actors and a crew. So while in making uh, the first project, <clears throat> I started to make photographs of each scene. So as we would shoot, I would then, before we tear the set down, it was really for technical reasons in order to make the piece work and not really so much um, an art, out of art, pure artistic desire. Um, but 
since we were um, taking stills of the shot, which all the shots with um, a film camera, I decided to bring my four by five camera and shoot all these, um, each scene. And it kind of was a nice tool because in terms of a time frame, there would be this last l lapse of time where, um, you know, the film is out, it's being, it's being processed, it's got to come back, then it has to be um, put in the computer and dumped on video, et cetera, that I wouldn't have anything. So I figured I want to have something from this. So it became these kind of storyboards where I could think about, in terms of editing, what my choices were and how things differed from this kind of script that we had developed um, to actually um, what it is we actually end up shooting. And they later then became photographs, and then through each project, I kind of photographed each scene. So they become, for me, um, in terms of working on the project, it's a really nice tool, and they kind of, as an after thing, they become photographs um, uh, that accompany the film projects, or kind of related photographs. So they're completely in a different, for I mean, it's completely different than any work that I've ever done in that way, but they're nice because they're, I use them as a tool, really, in terms of process. They're nice to have, just for me. Um, and below, on each one is text that doesn't really, it's not captioning in terms of exact words from the actors um, in the film, but more um, the idea behind the piece itself and kind of variations on that. So they're not really quotations or film stills in that way because they're not exactly from the film and they're not the same format. Um, but it becomes a different way to play with this imagery, which I thought I would kind of never really engage myself with. So these are stills from um, interior, exterior. I shouldn't call them really stills, photographs from um, call uh, interior, exterior. So now I will, um, let me start the, the video. And I'm just gonna show a, um, Hello? Hey. Yeah? Good. Mm -hmm. I'll be in the summer. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. this close.
shall be. Everything was planned out. And all you had to do. I know. I know. I mean, I was this close, but I could. I just, I couldn't. Yeah, right. Um, so, how's work? installation is very slow and there are like a lot of scenes that go very slowly. Um, but to give you a sense of um, what that what that piece is like. Yeah, hi. How you doing? Yeah, that's good. Hold on a second. Oh, 
<laughs> I reached the American ho hottest sex line. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I can't leave her. I can't leave her. But you just said that to like, too much. Yeah. Too much. So I just went home and I just closed it. Closed it after that, then I got a call. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then 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 I got my message. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. 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 Well, what, 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 मैंने नहीं पता जो मर्जी करो मेरे जो बात नहीं है ए, ए, एक मिनट है मैं कौन काम आया है मैं खुने काम शुरू किए हैं एक मिनट हेलो दिस इज आर बार आपने हो क्या हाय या कैन यू सी इफ देयर इज अ वुमन नेम किमरली एट द बार प्लीज ऑल राइट होल्ड ऑन प्लीज थैंक यू बात दिस कॉल करूंगा Okay. Are you Kimberly? This call is for you. Thank you. Hello? Hello, Kim? I'm waiting for Janine. Well, you know why I'm calling. Yeah. Yeah, she's looking for you again. Mm -hmm. No, she did not call you to see if I was sit here. You know, I'm sick and tired of this. Why is it that when you go out with somebody for a minute, they think they got to keep all your love? Hey, what is that? Um, uh, well, I'm not going to... Okay, so we're going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but that's called waiting. It kind of goes on and on through these different, and jumps from one person to the next in about four or five different languages, um, in Punjab, Spanish, um, and uh, Chinese and English, and kind of their connections and lack of connection to one another. Great, good. Um, as usual, I didn't say when I was giving my introduction, but as usual, um, we'll open it up to the audience for questions um, towards the end of the uh, session, so I want to ask some of my own, and and then it's your turn. And when when it comes your turn, please speak up so that we can actually hear you, um, and then other people in the audience can hear the question. I won't have to repeat it. Um, actually, it's a kind of interesting experience to, to listen. I didn't leave the stage because yeah. I figured somebody had to hold for it here, but uh, <laughs> but it's interesting to to to. Uh, to listen to the text without seeing the images, mm -hmm. and it reminds me when I'm on airplanes very often, I don't get the earphones and I watch the I watch the the image without hearing the text, mm -hmm. and I wondered a little bit in your process how closely linked the words are to the picture in your own mind, or whether they develop on separate tracks and converge at some point. Um. I guess in some ways there's a flatness to the imagery, and um, some of them it plays at odds, like the woman who is just. Um, uh, of the scene where the woman just says, oh, I'm tired of every time you go out with someone, they think they got the key to all your locks. I mean, she's kind of dressed up to look like Dorothy Dandridge. Um, so in some ways, there's um, a play between either the characterization or the way that the actor is um, made up um, that plays against what it is that they're saying. I mean, I try to make it, there, there's um, an expectation that maybe something else should come out of their mouth or um, in interior, exterior, there's a scene with two women in a bathtub while the women on the couch are having conversations about sex or kind of people who are sleeping with other people. Um, the conversation that they have in the bathtub is about work and kind of very flatly so about their day to day at work. So again, there, there's this thing that you might, it might suggest because there are two women in a tub that the nature of the conversation should be sexual, um, but it's not. 
And do the images sometimes precede the text? I mean, some, some, some people write dialogue before they set the stage, and some people set the stage before they write dialogue. Does this go back and forth for you? It goes back and forth. I mean, because they're very small productions, and I don't have, um, which is kind of interesting, because I don't have the time to build a relationship with the actors. Like, there's some ensemble, and we get to practice and rehearse. It's kind of, I give them a story um, maybe an hour before we start to shoot, and we kind of go over it, and I have them improvise. Um, so. Sometimes the stories kind of shift or change or kind of, um, I give them the story and then we just start shooting. So sometimes they insert things that aren't in the script that I haven't scripted, which is interesting because sometimes it changes the tone or with um, Jaya who was speaking in Chinese. I, mean, I didn't know what she said until we went back to edit. I mean, during the shoot, I mean, she was an art student, had no experience in acting, we're like, she was incredible. But we didn't know what she was saying, <laughs> or how, <laughs> how close she came to the actual script that was um, delivered. And in fact, I think she, um, I mean, there's something about getting up and going to pee or something, and there's something that she kind of shifts in it. Um, but that's kind of interesting to me because I, since I've worked for a very long time, so far malaically, and kind of I know exactly what the piece is going to look like by the time I get to production in working in these film pieces, the collaborative nature of it, it kind of, the project takes shape as it goes along. Um, so shifts and changes that are unexpected are actually quite welcomed. Um, and I find it, it's a lot of fun because it does, it slightly makes it different and has, I have to wrestle with the material in a different or less comfortable way than I'm used to. When you, when you were making work in, in the 80s, um, were you thinking narratively in this, to this degree and doing it differently or is the narrative something that grew out organically out of the I mean, I work? started more as a poet and kind of wrote stories before I started doing that kind of work. So this is kind of a return um, to a more story-like or narrative, linear narrative form that I am probably more familiar with. And that the, the work um, from the 80s was more a way of deconstruct, of course, hate to use that word. Go for it, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> but deconstructing that kind of use of narrative, which is, I mean, really comes out of the 50s and the 60s, not that I presume to be doing anything new and different. I mean, concrete poetry had that kind of tenet in terms of um, making lists and using um, words as devices to tell a narrative rather than in, within the structure of sent sentence structure or prose. Um, so it's kind of a, it's, it gets me the kind of the details and kind of of narrative in that sort of way in terms of language. Um, it's kind of fun because it, it's a much different thing in terms of working with these film projects to um, have someone speak a particular story and kind of the way that you, what you want to come from that message as opposed to someone interpreting or reading the written word. Um, so that was a kind of nice um, difference in way of working, I should say. Well, as long as we're sort of in the, in the, the, the story side of it, um, one approach is to deal with types, to do or undo types, mm -hmm. and the other one is to create characters. And it seems like some of the earlier work, the photographic work, was about types or the expectation of types, mm -hmm. the way people uh, cast the people in their world into certain types knowing very little about them mm -hmm. and these seem that is to say the the, the, the videos and even the the, uh, the felt photograph whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. um, seem much more about characters is that actually a, a proper perception or is that just something no, I think that's probably proper I think um in that they're kind of, they're still open-ended. I mean, in some ways, they're narr not completely fully structured characters. I mean, they don't have, um, you don't get a full sense of um, their beginning or their end or kind of what completely their motivation is in a kind of traditional sense. Where, and the older work um, left things very open-ended and kind of questioning the way that one interprets that. But I still hope that in some ways, um, that the characters, I mean, you know, given film or given kind of the nature of what we n look at in film and kind of representation, that the characters are still much different um, than one, w what one would normally engage. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of a development of characters, which kind of makes me nervous. How <laughs> so? Um, because it, it is, it's, it's like doing the reverse of defining a particular type, but I'm hoping that I kind of work it in such a way that um, you realize that you don't have that much information and that maybe your expectations of um, what this person is going to say or what they're going to be talking about um, comes as a, as a surprise or comes from a different um, kind of a, a different take or a different uh, 
area than you would expect in terms of um, what's coming out of their mouths or that, you know, um, one woman, you know, one minute she's listening in Spanish, then she's listening in Chinese and kind of um, just the multi-layered of the way people live. Uh, it's kind of, I guess, what part of that characterization is after. Um, in, in the 1980s, a lot of work, and yours included, uh, was addressed to the viewer without identifying clearly who was doing the addressing or who the viewer was, and everybody mm -hmm. sort of had to find a position relative mm -hmm. to the information provided. Mm -hmm. um, still in all, one sort of imagined certain mm -hmm. kind of viewers, like the gays imagined a certain kind of male viewer. Mm -hmm. Certain kind of work that dealt with racial typecasting dealt right. also with an assumption of who was out there in the audience and who was doing the looking. Right. Um, do you see the, the video work in the same way, or do you see there, well, one is, if it's different, do you think there's been a mm -hmm. change in the audience, or is it simply hmm. that the work has <laughs> changed because you wanted it to go someplace else? I think the work has changed. I wouldn't say the audience has changed. Um, that much, and I really don't have um, a particular expectation as to, um, in terms of demographics, who that particular audience is. I think, you know, hopefully it's just a wide range of um, people. But um, I think the work has changed in a way that uh, that work for me was so formulaic and about a particular subject in a particular way that, um, in working that way, you can make a million of those things. I mean, once you kind of get it and once you get um, the way that that formula can be applied to different ideas, to, it's just, it, for me, it gets a little bit boring because it's about cranking them out. While, I mean, that might be very good for, for me financially in terms of you know, having a career and having a set way of working, um, it seems very confining and in, in a way um, like work, like dr the drudgery of just doing something. Um, the film pieces, though, it gets me to consider, well, then what would a characterization be and kind of what are, the, what are you trying to say with particular individuals who are telling a particular story? So the two women who are in interior, exterior, and the one woman says, oh, I could have killed him, but I couldn't, it's kind of playing on what is a normally a scene between two women who, um, one has been abused by a man and it should be one of empathy and kind of consideration and she's completely fed up and ha doesn't even want to speak to her. So it's kind of a somewhat, I would hope, a kind of different reaction for the kind of scene um, that one would normally encounter that the other woman actually doesn't have the patient is quite disgusted that she didn't follow through with the murder. <laughs> <laughs> So in that way, to me, it has hopefully a kind of different. It kind of vaguely <laughs> reminds me of a, there's a great line in one of Yvonne Rayner's films where there are two women sitting in a in a diner downtown talking, and mm -hmm. she, she says, uh, "You know the the fastest way to a man's heart," and uh, one woman says, "No," and she says, "Through his chest." <laughs> <laughs> that is a good. <laughs> um, anyway, that is a good uh, <laughs> but um, I'm also thinking about also about the context, basically. Yeah. In the 1980s, uh, the political aura, the political intent, the political dialogue was very, very heavy. And a lot mm -hmm. of work was misinterpreted in that context. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it was directed straight to it. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that at least by this time in this decade, that's changed a lot. And I wondered if you could say a little bit about how you experienced the 80s when you were making work with, hmm. which hit hard on sex and gender and mm -hmm. racial issues, and how you see yourself in relation to those things now doing right. a different kind of work. Um, or related kind of work. Well, I think it was a, a moment kind of in the art world where um, there was a sense of pluralism um, in terms of uh, providing an arena for different points of view. Um, I think it's two things. I think also in kind of outside of the art world and in terms of the way uh, multiculturalism or affirmative action and kind of also a lot of the um, efforts from the 60s, how those things have come to a head in the 80s in terms of change also reflect a kind of shifting um, for good and for bad reasons. Um, in terms of my work specifically, I would say that I still have an interest in that subject matter. It's kind of the vehicle or the way in which I get that done is different. I think some of those same issues are still present um, in the works that I've done over the past four or five years. It's just that I've chosen to kind of work them differ differently visually. Um, so for me, it, it kind of seems that as an artist, my relationship to the work is a much different thing than a kind of audience relationship. So while those things are going on, 
you know, by, by 1990, I had already stopped using the figure when there was still an expectation or kind of when it was still, um, in some ways, work that was uh, applauded in the art world or kind of work that a lot of people had an interest in, I kind of pulled back um, to the dismay <laughs> of many people who would walk into an exhibition of mine and go, is this a Lorna Simpson show? I don't quite, I don't <laughs> quite understand. Um, so I, I, I think keeping myself close to my own interests and my own um, relationship to the work has proven to be a much more healthy relationship to me than following kind of what's going on in terms of uh, either the art world and, their in, and those interests um, kind of at large. So I think, I mean, by the time this work is developed, I think people finally, like later on, say to, you know, say to me now, oh, well, you've made a move, but that move kind of happened five years even prior to that. Um, but I, again, I think it, it's based on kind of the times outside of the art world, the times that we're living in, but also um, my own desire with the work to, to find another medium or another way of working and another way of getting at that subject matter, not to make it easier for an audience, not, to, not in any of that sort of way, but more um, for me as an artist to explore different areas that I know that I've always had an interest in. On, on sort of flip it over on the formal side, I mean, in the, the work in the 80s and on up through into the middle 90s, um, the picture was always presented in some object way. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the texts were also, I mean, to put a text on a certain kind of label, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like a, a, a I don't know. The, a plaque, the yeah. Plaque mm -hmm. kind of label, or to do it on a museum type label, but where it has a certain physical entity. Um, when you move to, to, uh, to film or video, you're dealing with pictures which are complete unto themselves. Do you think about other ways of objectifying or making artificial uh, the image so that people don't then fall into it as if it really was just, you know, real life? Oh, you mean so being completely captivated yeah, how, by how the you, nature? Yeah, how, how, do you, how do you push people who away push people at the away? same time you, you draw them in when you change the language well, they were, as much? I guess it depends on the pieces. I mean, I think interior, exterior, because uh, that's a multi-projection, uh, and in mm -hmm. some ways um, it's not the nature. You don't feel you're being drawn by the um, narrative, but it's not linear in the way that it's delivered. Mm -hmm. um, so you feel like you're kind of... Um, your attention is kind of grabbed and pulled all over the place. So I would say that feeling of uneasiness is probably most present in that work. The other two, because their single projections have that thing where people get completely engrossed. But I think as, for me, it was more um, a thing of really trying to explore uh, the way that I would work with actors and the kind of the way that I would work with a linear narrative, um, which I hadn't done um, in a very conscious way before. Um, and for me, that was a kind of an interesting experiment to see how I would f uh, fulfill that of trying to create a linear narrative that has that isn't really that linear that is has all these interruptions and disjointed um, narratives. Does that answer? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm gonna ask one more and then we'll open it up. But do you see do you see this work as a progression, in the sense of moving from one place to the next to the next to the next, or do you? in a sense, reserve the right, and I would guess that you do from the photographs that you showed that were sort of outtakes of the films, mm -hmm. to double back at any point and pick up some other means, some other way, some other thing that you've done before but done it differently. Because in, mm -hmm. in a certain period of time, people thought art moved forward and didn't look back. Right. And I wondered if you view your progression in any way that way or if you see it differently. On two, I mean, in two levels, I think I do look back. I've looked back a lot at my own work and have done plays on my own work, mm -hmm. which is like my own personal joke, which sometimes other people see, <laughs> but um, I kind of do it consciously. Um, like for instance, I mean, in thinking of my next film project, which seems very obvious, but it's doing a completely thing where you don't see the face of the, of the actors in the film and that it's completely dialogue of kind of all, of all these different backs, so it's complete. Um, reversal of the reverse shot. You don't get the conversation of the two heads talking. They're kind of obscured, um, kind of referring back to the other work. Um, but I also kind of, I also like to be on edge in terms of the photographs or in terms of working these narratives, which forces me to work in a way that I haven't worked before and kind of uh, wrestling um, formally with material in a way that I've resisted. 
So I do both. I kind of go back and also put myself in a position of being completely uncomfortable and wrestling with material in a way that I am not used to or not comfortable with. But I find that kind of exhilarating after the fact. <laughs> Are you tempted, like some people have been tempted, to actually make feature films for distribution in the normal channels, or are you happy to deal with film in I'm happy to country? do it this way. I mean, I'd like to make small films. I'm not that interested um, in that way of doing a big production, no. Because in some ways, I mean, it's a level of control, and it's a whole other arena, and kind of relationship to the audience is not the same thing that I've been afforded in working the way that I work now. So this one's, this is your turf, it's... <laughs> That's, right. That's right, just, but it, it's very nice and they're very satisfying. I mean, they get shot in about four or five days, another week to edit. I mean, they're done very quickly and very succinctly, which I kind of let you go in, you do it and you're out. I mean, to work months and months, I don't know how much I would still love it if I had to do it that way. So no epics for the time being. No being. epics for the moment. <laughs> okay, can I open it up and again, please uh, speak clearly enough that one can hear, so it'll make things sort of move better. And also, don't be bashful. Yeah, please. I'm familiar with Kolchak. Yes. And your images, I, I couldn't get truly a, a, a definition as to what you did. Did you put photographic imagery on those black? No, I just, I uh, selected the images from James Van Der Zee's photographs, and since all of his photographs are very formal portraits with vases or a different arrangement of objects, yes. um, the vase is what I had them recreate. So they physically made the vases for me. Okay, so you did not end up doing... No, I didn't do it myself. Okay, no. I don't know how to blow glass. <laughs> <laughs> I tried, though. I made a little vase that looks like a knot. <laughs> <laughs> Very, I love it, but no. <laughs> yeah, I was working, whose names I kind of forget, because it was kind of quite a while ago, but um, working with two glass blowers uh, who could fashion anything I wanted. I mean, if I said, I want a t 10 foot tall woman, they were like, okay, we'll be done by six. I mean, they, and they would have done it for me. But, um. So those were not yours, and there were no images. Right, the image is the felt piece that called um, Nine Props. And that's, I was kind of showing the evolution of kind of when ideas don't work or kind of when I feel dissatisfied with something, but kind of how I kind of hit it over the head a million times to make it work. So I guess blowing glass is not like clay where you can put two notches in and call it an ashtray. It doesn't <laughs> no. work. <laughs> you, can, you, you can do the two notch thing with a little metal pole, but it's, 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 it's elaborate. <laughs> it looks easy, but it's elaborate. Yeah. Um, Come now. Yeah, please. No, I think part of that was the problem with the space because it's completely concrete. So we didn't put, at that time, because I didn't know any better, I didn't put any carpeting on the floor, which would have made it a little bit um, better in terms of the sound. But because you know, it's a concrete ceiling, concrete floor, concrete walls, it reverberates the sound and makes almost an echo so that it's not as clear a sound um, as it could have been or in that particular installation. So it wasn't on purpose. <laughs> That's what you're asking. Mm -hmm. No, well, what it was is that the characters, um, because it's seven projections playing all at once, uh, each character um, comes up, dissolves into a scene one at a time so that you afforded kind of the clarity to be able to hear one narrative at a time. And it kind of goes around the room. Um, so that was w how it was supposed to work. Yes, in the middle there, please. I just have one question to ask. The scene that you have of the, uh, the lake and the, the woods, mm -hmm. there seems to be an overlay of grid. Right. 
Yeah. Um, in a lot of my work, there's segmentation and the segmentation of um, the image, whether it was the work that I did with figures, but they were and working with Polaroids or kind of um, in repeating the images. There's always this kind of thing of the reproduction of the image or dissecting it, not showing it completely in its entirety. So with the felt pieces, A, technically, that they're printed on um, squares. And I kind of like that they weren't these kind of continuous m murals. They're kind of these grids of images um, that are, I don't know, 30 by 36 inches. So that's part of. Uh, the kind of formal aspect of the work that's kind of carried um, through. So all the felt pieces have that sort of seg segmentation. All the way in the back. You have to speak up, though. It's hard to hear you. I'm sorry. Monochromatic color. <laughs> I like red. <laughs> um, uh, I, I have used color in the past, I mean, in terms of using Polaroids, um, but they were very monochromatic looking. But I, I'm thinking about maybe the next project might be in color, because in, for, actually for call waiting, in some of the scenes, actually, we took you know, snapshots, and they were saying, wow, it would look quite beautiful had we done it in color. So maybe I'll have the nerve. I don't know. It's something that I avoid, but that I shouldn't avoid for too much longer. Yes, please. I hope this isn't too presumptuous, but I love your back as they were mm -hmm. uh, gridded. And I think that the intimacy that you set up with the viewer and the kind of dialogue and all the ideas that are generated from that kind of experience are very exciting. Mm -hmm. Personally, I feel with the video that there's so much going on, it becomes somewhat distracting and, mm. and that the wonderful ideas Mm -hmm. So I know that Robert was discussing possibly mm -hmm. reaching back again, and I wondered if you would sustain some of those images in the future photographically. Probably not. No. no. Not. Well, because, I mean, uh, for my relationship to the work, it's kind of, for me to go back to it would mean that, um, A, I hadn't finished something in terms of the content of that work or didn't finish my relationship just to it in terms of working, but it's so familiar to me, I could crank out a gazillion million of them. And in some ways, that's a kind of really, um, and not to, I'm, I'm saying, you know, over a period of time, having worked over a period of time, you become very familiar with the work, and the easier it becomes to, with my relationship to the work, in order to create it, that means that it's time to shift to something else. So while the newer work might not seem as interesting or, um, as developed in terms of ideas, really my relation, it kind of in terms of process, it's far more an interesting place for me as an artist than to go back to the other work, although I'm glad you really, <laughs> really <laughs> liked it. Um, yeah. Right. Well, I mean, I wanted them to create this kind of silhouette. That's why they're black. And the, in that silhouette that you would use that silhouette as a guide when looking at the photographs of James Van Der Zee. So you could identify the shape of a vase, although, you know, in, the photo, in his photographs they're far more detailed and you know, have a lot more, uh, a lot more ornate. This was, you know, just like you have a silhouette guide of, uh, from a photograph of a group of 20 people, they're all in silhouette and kind of numbered, uh, identifying who's in the image. These kind of stand in, in that same way. Um, since we're now into second questions, you first and then you second. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Also identify it as a 
a black person? No. You would not because most of your images are people that you uh, seem to confuse. No, I don't. I mean, I think it's a formal quality, like I said, is about silhouette in that um, it's about this shape is derived from something. So in order to, I, I mean, if I made it transparent, then it would, you would kind of figure out, well, then it wouldn't work f for those purposes. Um, I think it's, it's, it's like a rose is a rose, a, a black vase is a black vase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, another question had to do with, um, t as you said, putting together a picture, and you said you In, I, don't, I don't quite understand finding out something about myself. Learning, I mean. finding out further, <laughs> something that you didn't expect from yourself within, uh, because you had gone that far with one person. Um, I think in working with the film projects, it's interesting because it's completely collaborative and in some ways, um, like I said, the idea that I begin with is, or is, is still there, but the image of what I have of what the project is going to look like is completely different than what I end up with. So in that way, I find that kind of relationship really in interesting, um, since a lot of the work that I have done in the past um, relied solely on myself, or working, as I said, you hire someone to fabricate something. I mean, there's something very finite about that, because once you have plans and um, it's drawn out, I can visualize in my mind what it's gonna look like. So by the time I go to production, I'm pretty much done um, with the piece and have moved on to other things. In terms of working on, with the film projects, it's interesting um, just in per terms of process because I'm not done and it's not that simple. Um, so that I find, I mean, in terms of process is really fun and exciting. Um, yes, please. I wanna say that I love your work and I might oh. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to say something mm -hmm. a little encouraging about a person who liked the immediacy and being able to get into the, the earlier work in that. It seems to me that the theme of what I'm going to say about her own work and its progress has a lot to do with not letting things become easy and not letting things become hooked into Oh, thank you, Roger. Sweet. <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a good friend. Yes. It's nice when friends say something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah please. I mean, I, I had an interest in undergraduate school and really in terms of underground film and filmmaking out of the 50s and 60s, which kind of explains more the work that I did in the 80s, I think, in terms of talking about structure and kind of relationship to the audience and kind of, I mean, I guess, you know, this to off the top of my head and to think of Godard, I mean, that's kind of the king of talking about slippage and kind of the... Um, the image and the dialogue or the image and the soundtrack and play with that, which has all become conventions of, you know, everything from a TV commercial uh, now. Um, but 
kind of in the late 70s, I had a real, and Yvonne Rayner for that matter, had a really interest in looking at those films and kind of why were they structured or why did they make those films the way that they made them, um, given also the times that, that what was going on in the United States and kind of um, in Africa and in Europe. So that, in, in kind of studying the history of film and studying those different um, artists, really got me interested in, in thinking about the way you structure things and the way that you present things to an audience. So I would say that I put it on the back burner and kind of the Wexner afforded me the opportunity because they had an avid machine and it made um, kind of jumping in, which I mean, I mean, technically I don't know how to work in film. I don't know how to set up the camera. I don't know how to load it, et cetera. But you know, let me hire a crew and I know, and, you know I can tell them what to do on that level. So it was really kind of um, jumping in from that position of like knowing that I knew that I knew, knew how to structure things, um, but, not, but not wanting to get um, artistically so uh, held back by the financial side of it. And these were opportunities where it made it very simply to jump in and kind of make the sort of project that I wanted to make. Okay, I think one more question, and then the why um, has its rules and we must vacate, so please. <laughs> Um, the Wexner Center is um, a art institution that's a non-collecting museum that is in Columbus, Ohio, and they are also connected with the um, Ohio State University. And they have a, an amazing program for um, theater, dance, visual arts, etc. and they have a great institution in Columbus. What was the other, <laughs> I'm sorry. I went, I, go to school. I went to school at the School of Visual Arts here in New York for undergraduate school, and. University of California, San Diego for graduate school. And Max is the person's name? Uh, yes, from a family that actually developed, yes, the museum. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okie doke. Um, I want to thank everybody um, and uh, thank, thank Lorna. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And uh, I can't say same time, same station, but we will, <laughs> I hope, see some of you next spring. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.